many teachers from Ukraine. So thank you all for joining. Um, today we're going to explore three areas that I believe are key to helping students achieve academic success. The first one is content that is real world, relevant, and engaging to students and that promotes critical thinking. This is so important for learners in the 21st century. If students are curious and interested, we feel that they will want to learn and we also feel very strongly that the content needs to respect our learners as very intelligent and thinking beings. The second area is language skill building that's explicit, communicative, and purposeful. And last, the third key is vocabulary instruction that is principled, carefully selected, contextual, and recycled. So we're going to start with content. Oops, sorry. We're going to start with uh, content because that's really, without content, you cannot really do anything. And um, we're going to, first of all, consider, because my premise here is that we want content that promotes deeper thinking, that naturally engages students in critical thinking activities. And so we want, I want to start with a, with a poll, and we're going to try to make this as interactive as possible, a, a poll that asks you this question. So Emily will put up the poll. Remember, there's no right answer here, or wrong answer. Well, that's th these, these results are great. Um, it's kind of what I expected. It looks like most of you do teach critical thinking, which suggests that you have a clear idea of what it is and how to teach, you, teach it. But many of you also are unsure, and I completely respect that, understand that, because critical thinking is quite, you know, there are many definitions, there's a lot of ambiguity about the term, and how do we really know when somebody is thinking critically? So excellent, that's very, very good. I'm going to do another poll now, and I want you to um, do this poll here. Which of the following activities involves critical thinking? And you write yes if it does, and no if it doesn't. <laughs> this is great. Again, these results are so interesting to me. They're wonderful. It seems that we can pretty easily, easily identify which everyday activities require critical thinking and which ones really don't. Uh, brushing your teeth. I, I suppose if you're a dentist, maybe there's some critical thinking there. Um, and jogging also, eh, not so sure if that involves, but again, if you are a, 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 a professional athlete, perhaps it does require critical thinking. The activities like choosing courses and traveling between points A and B with limited time and budget, those are activities that require kind of comparing and evaluating and inferring and then ranking and, 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 and prioritizing. So those are clearly critical thinking activities. This shows that we know that we do critical thinking in our daily lives. And even more important, actually, well, I don't know if not more important, but equally important is, I have to close the, the poll, uh, is um, it's very, very important in the workplace and in academics. Uh, in fact, just here are two quotes. All research says that critical thinking and academics in the workplace is important. The ability to think clearly and rationally is important, whatever you choose to do. Being able to think well and solve problems systematically is an asset for any career. And then the second quote, California teachers say that critical thinkies, thinking skills, not scores on standardized tests, 
are the best way to, assure, to assess whether students are prepared for success in college and the workplace. Those are pretty strong statements about the value of critical thinking. So um, what I want to do, well, actually, let me just go to the next slide here. And if you Google critical thinking, you will come up with hundreds of definitions. And I just want to share one definition, which is uh, from the organization criticalthinking.org. And I like this one for many reasons, but it's the critical thinking is that mode of thinking about any subject, content, or problem in which the thinker improves the quality of his or her thinking by skillfully analyzing, assessing, and reconstructing it. It entails effective communication and problem-solving abilities, as well as commitment to overcome our native egocentrism and sociocentrism. And I particularly like that last phrase. It helps us overcome our native egocentrism and sociocentrism. In other words, we want students to basically start having a more open mind and being able to consider perspectives from multiple different uh, perspectives and not being sort of single-minded. So content, back to the content. So we're going to start with photos. And some people feel that photography in our books, in National Geographic Learning, we love photography, you may have noticed. And we, some people say that the photos are just, you know, decoration. In fact, we choose our photos very carefully and purposefully, and they serve a pedagogic, they have a pedagogical purpose. For us, a good photo demands questions, and we feel it's our job to uh, our job, it's our, our mission, part of our mission is to bring the world into the classroom and the classroom to life. And one way to do that is with photos. Um, if you think about the world we live in today, it's so visual. And there, you know, there are lots of uh, examples of sort of photoshopped images that you're not sure if they're real or not. But one of the things we value very much is bringing the world in and having students get inspired and engaged through photography. So let me show you this photo here and the, and the questions. Well, what is it a photo of? The first question is, what is it, this an image of? Anybody know? What is it? Well, I'll, I'll answer. It's a landfill, a landfill in um, outside of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And look at the second question. What is the purpose or message of this image? Anybody want to think about what, what, what's the purpose of this image? Poverty around the world reminds you of a movie, pollution to save our planet, homeless. OK, these are all excellent answers. Um, and what thoughts, emotions, or reactions does it provoke? What does it make you feel? Whoa, there's so many answers here, I can't, I can't follow it all. <laughs> but they're excellent answers. I see sadness, disgust, lucky, angry. All of these are viable answers. And you can see how getting students to respond to number two and number three is digging more deeply into what's really is the purpose of the image. In fact, there's an interesting story about this. this these are, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, they are canta, uh, oh, I, forget, I forgot the word exactly, but these men, um, they, their jobs, they get paid very little to search through the garbage. And they're looking, for, um, they're looking for recyclable materials. And in fact, they are, despite the fact that it's a difficult job and it doesn't pay much, they are very proud of what they do because they say they are actually helping the, the environment, which is true. In fact, uh, one, one, uh, one of them says one single can of soda that they can pick up is of great importance because we can recycle it. So that, you can see how it, that opens the students to a different perspective on something, on our, our, our what, the assumptions that we come with. We come with, oh, garbage is dirty, you know, I, I wouldn't want to do that. But if you look at it from a different perspective, you learn a lot. Here's another one. And let me ask you, what do you think, well, let me ask you this. What kind of question could you ask about this picture to get at critical thinking? Uh, 
sunset. Okay, what are they doing? Okay, and that's a very good question, uh, Maria, because first you want them to know what to be able to understand what they're doing even. Nature is wonderful. Uh, what are the people doing? <laughs> it's going so fast. What are they admiring? Okay, let me show you actually the you can see here the caption maybe. These are people on the shore of Djibouti City, Djibouti, which is in the Horn of Africa, trying to get a cellular, cellular signal. So you might ask, well, what other parts of the world do people have to you know, go to certain places to get a, a cellular signal? And why is it so critically important for them to be getting this signal? It has to do with this global communication and keeping connected to the world. So it's, what are they celebrating? Look, I mean, you, you could look at it as a celebration because they've got candles, or it could be candles that they sh they're shining. But again, opening your students' minds to multiple different perspectives on an image. Don't just ask the ordinary question, what are they doing, and stop there, but go deeper. And here's one last one. Anybody think of a question you might ask your students about this particular photo? Invite aliens. <laughs> What, how does he feel? Right, how does he feel? Where is he? That's a good question. Where is he? It's a challenge. Is he cold? I think we probably know he's cold. <laughs> what is he thinking of? All right, these are all really great questions. Um, and the idea is that you want to get the students to personalize here and think about, well, what what does it feel like? And and more uh, more more to the point is why did he take this selfie? This is a selfie after an al avalanche. This is um, Corey Richard, who is a photographer for National Geographic, and he took this image moments after an avalanche where he thought he was going to die. And in a few minutes, we're going to see a video featuring Corey as well. But uh, again, the idea of asking students what they think more deeply this, why did he take this picture? Um, and I don't have the answer, but it gets students to think about why we do certain things. Okay, we're going to move on to the next kind of content, which is infographics. And Emily is going to do another poll. How often do you think students will have to interpret infographics in their college work? Okay, very often, sometimes rarely. No vote. And I suppose it depends on where you are, you know, where you are, um, at what kind of academic curriculum students are getting in their college work. It looks like ver between very often and sometimes. That's pretty much uh, the bulk of you are saying. In fact, um, not just in academic work, but in, in business work as well, infographics, um, let me close out of that. Actually, I, I should have probably said what infographics are first. Infographics are any graphic representation of information that is intended to make the information clearer or easier to understand. Now, they are not always successful, but that's their goal, is to make information easier to interpret. Um, here are just, I pulled these from uh, higher ed textbooks at Cengage. Here are biology and chemistry books. You can see infographics. And here are business and history texts, also from Cengage higher ed materials. They are extremely common. As I went through the materials, uh, you know, they're on almost every page. Charts, maps, diagrams, all kinds of uh, infographics. And so we feel that we want to expose students to infographics early on. And by the way, all of these pages are from pathways, either listening, speaking, or reading, writing, different activities. And my, what I want you to, you to experience is what the student will experience as they go through these materials. This is a, an infographic from a unit on, the unit is about um, the shortage of water, basically the, the situation of the status of water around the world. And, and most of you probably know that you know, water shortage is a huge issue for uh, people all over the world. Um, and this is an infographic. You can see here that 
the inf there's information in, let me get my pointer actually, there's text that they have to navigate here, there are little images and numbers and more text down here. It's not linear text, it's coming at them at various, uh, diff in different ways. And what we like to do is we always want to ask them, and I think somebody did that with the photos as well, you first of all want to establish that they know what they're looking at. And the very first question is, what is hidden or virtual water? And the answer is down here. You can't see it because it's too small. But they might look over here for the answer. The answer is actually in text. So students need to learn that you know, information could be in any of the, any of the spots on an in infographic. Now that first question is really just a um, basic comprehension, a literal comprehension. Do you understand what you're reading? The next question, how many gallons of water are required to produce a cup of tea? And you probably cannot see it, but it's over here, this one here. And I, th I think the answer is six gallons of water, which is quite a bit. And how many gallons of water are required to produce a t-shirt or a pair of jeans, rather? A pair of jeans is up here, 2,900 gallons a lot of water. The really interesting question is the last one. Does any of the information from the infographics surprise you? And let me ask you, does any of that information surprise you? It's taking 2,900s of gallons for blue jeans. It takes 766 for a t-shirt. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so, and here we are. We are educated, informed adults. But imagine this is, you know, so ex interesting for students to learn about the fact that things that they use, there is hidden water in all of it. Which of these questions, which of these four questions do you think asks for critical thinking? One, two, three, or four, or one, two, and three, or all of them are four, 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 four. Yeah, very good, very good. You might also say that two does because, in fact, being able to interpret information visually is a kind of critical thinking skill. So we could say that two and four does do. Here's another one, and I love this one. This shows you uh, how did we get there? And the top show, the end is the cell phone, of course. The top shows the audio evolution, and the bottom shows, I could use my pointer, the bottom shows the visual evolution. So you have these two bands leading to you to the cell phone. And I'm going to ask you right now, look at these three questions, and which of them do you think um, asks for critical thinking? Four, four, one, two, three, there are only three. <laughs> three, one, two, and three, 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 boo, 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 oh, so fast, okay. Well, let's look at the first one. What does the timeline show? How are past telephones and cameras different from those today? Does that require critical thinking? I would contend that it does because comparing past and present actually does make students you have to evaluate what was what the conditions were in the past and what they are now. So yes, it does require critical thinking. Number two, what other devices or um, what other devices are different in the were different in the past and explain how they were different? Does that require critical thinking? Yes, it also does because you have to explain the difference, and that me means again being able to understand or analyze what a product was before and how it is now and how it has changed. And clearly number three, what is the next step for phones, cameras, and other technologies is critical thinking. So all three of them do. Um, and what we're trying to show here is how content that is authentic, that is real, actually leads easily to critical thinking and language development. All right. We're now going to play a, a part of a video, just a part of it, and I want you to listen carefully and to the video because we're going to ask you questions afterwards. My education 
came from observing what was happening around me and observing that richness that comes with struggle. I was always looking for a way to translate what I was seeing around me and photography became my voice in this big, very confusing world. And that was, that was the beginning. I think adventure is anything that puts us outside our comfort zone. In my world, that has always been going into the mountains. In 2010, 2011, I went to Pakistan to climb in the Himalayan winter. We did the first ascent of Gashabram 2, an 8,000 meter peak in the Karakoram Himalaya. And that trip changed my life forever. On the descent, we were hit by an avalanche that nearly killed all three of us. When I realized that I had not died, I turned a camera on myself and took an image. And that image ended up being put on the cover of National Geographic. There was no way of knowing at the time that that image that was really just my way of dealing with stress was gonna push my life in such a dramatic direction towards telling that larger story of, of what it means to hurt and what it means to triumph and what it means to, to be human. I've never been comfortable in the place that I'm in. I can't stop and sit. It's a constant engine that just keeps driving me towards the things that are unknown to me. So what did you think? And I, I'm sorry, we should have had the captions on because all of our videos actually have captions and apparently some of you were unable to hear. But um, as Emily says, we will post this video uh, so you can you can hear it and, and watch it again. And I, we stopped it because I didn't want to take too much time, but it is amazing. And so now your first task is, let me see, your first task is to, to answer these questions here. Uh, you have to do, you say you're going to put one and A, B, let's do one first. One, what's the answer for number one? For Richards, photography is a way to A, B, or C. Wow, you guys are good students, <laughs> very good. <laughs> but you can see, and, and I know some of you couldn't hear the audio, and, and, and remember that students will get to hear it many times. The answer is actually A. For him, it's a way to show what it means to be human. What about number two? Richard is motivated to A, B, or C. Yep, looks like C is the answer. Explore what is unknown to him. He's an explorer, so he wants to go to new places. He can never sit still. And number three, a very good question. The purpose of this video is A, B, or C? Wow, OK, excellent. It is B, to explain what motivates him to take photographs. So now you, know, you have more context about, about that photo. But that photo was chosen for the cover of National Geographic magazine once. You know, it, it's such a powerful photo that shows the human condition when it's suffering. Now I want to ask you, what is a question that you could ask your students about that video that would dig deeply and get them to use their critical thinking muscles. Was it worth it? What a great question, Marta. <laughs> Was it worth it? Anybody else come up with a good question you could ask your students? What motivates you? Yes. Would you do this again? Have you had any similar experience? I love those questions. They're very, very good. Now, I'm, I'm going to pull a quote from the video because Richard says, I had no way of knowing that that image was going to push my life in such a dramatic direction towards telling that larger story of what it means to hurt, what it means to triumph, and what it means to be human. So that quote, imagine that you can ask your students those very questions. What does it mean to hurt? 
and we all live in different parts of the world where human suffering is, you know, there are various kinds of human suffering that students could personalize. What does it mean to triumph? Another really important question and allowing students to be to personalize. And when students personalize, the language becomes internalized and it sticks. It, the language it has a better tendency to stick or to be, to be maintained, retained rather. So excellent. All right, we're going to move on because yes, we love our content. The content is very exciting and that is the basis of everything we do in our publications. But students also need, besides the engaging content, it's my belief that students also may need academic language skills that are explicit, that are contextualized, that are practiced and applied, and that are recycled. That they need to learn the language skills. After all, that's what they're doing. They're language students. Now, we get the content that captures their attention, that respects them as, as, as thinking and, and adults, uh, students, and then we use, the, use that to help them build language skills. So I'm going to show you just quickly here. This is how, um, if, for example, in Pathways Listening and Speaking, the language skill here is a speaking skill, asking for and giving opinions. Notice how the skill is very concise. We don't spend a lot of time with meta language. It's here are the ways to ask for and give opinions. And then the activity, and you can't see it very well, but the activity asks students to imagine that they are in a situation where there's limited water supply, and this is the unit on water. And they are asked to work in a group to collaborate, a good 21st century skill, collaborate and prioritize how they would use their water. Would they use it to drink, to flush the toilet, to brush their teeth, to, what, to do laundry? So they have to prioritize the, their, um, their, their decision their, or the, 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 their yeah, their, their decision, their choices here. And that, it's language skills, but it's also contextualized, and it is also critical thinking because they have to prioritize. Here's another example, just to show you a different kind of skill. This is note-taking. Again, a very short explanation, and then an immediate application, having them try it on the listening that they are doing. And now I want to show you how a sequence of skills, and this is from the reading book, and we're going to do some reading. Well, you're actually going to do some listening. But this is a sequence of reading skill activities. And I want you to think about them, about how they build. Because it's important when you teach language skills that they build, and that it's not just all asking basic comprehension questions, but that you go deeper and get them to really work with the language and work with the ideas in a more meaningful way. This is from a unit in Reading Writing Level 1 called Don't Give Up. So read this introduction here. This is the first paragraph. And let me ask you, what would you do after your students read this first paragraph? What would you do? What would you ask your students? Can you relate to this? That's, oh, that's a good question. Can you relate to this? Why this happened? Uh huh. Make hypotheses, yes. Elicit what they think this could be happening. There's a really good, what is wrong? <laughs> OK, excellent. So this sets you up. The introduction to this reading sets you up to have the students predict. And predicting is an important reading skill because, you, as you all know, when you start to predict, you activate your schema, and then it's easier to understand what you're going to read. What are some reasons that these students with the lower IQ scores were getting the highest grades? What do you think? What, now use your critical thinking skills and tell me what are some reasons why this was happening? Why do you think they, they were getting the, the lower IQ score students were getting better grades? Motivation could be a factor. The smart kids were under too much pressure, good. Uh, 
the smart kids didn't worry about results. Maybe they didn't pay attention, lack of motivation. I see motivation, interest, motivation, motivation, good, okay. Maybe they were tired or hungry, that's great. Language barrier, lack of interest, okay. The teachers, too many tests. So we're gonna find out what some of the reasons are. You know, some people in other groups I've led, they said maybe they got help from their parents, uh, maybe the less smart kids just worked harder, and maybe the smarter kids felt that they didn't have to work. Maybe there's motivation. So now we're going to show you, this is the page. You can see it's a beautiful photo, the secret of success. And success, by the way, success for me does not look like this. I am not going to be crossing any mountain on a type road. Success looks very different for me, but that, this is... Think about the critical thinking questions you could ask about this photo. It's really cool. But Emily, we, we can't read it because it's too small, but Emily is going to play the audio for just the first part of this. Listen carefully because we are going to ask you some questions after. To try to solve this mystery, Duckworth entered a PhD program in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. She began to research people in a variety of fields salespeople, college students, army cadets, and teachers in poor neighborhoods. She asked people to rate themselves using a list of statements. For example, I finish whatever I begin. In another study, she recorded people's responses to questions such as, would you rather have a dollar now or two dollars tomorrow? From her research, Duckworth realized that many successful people, salespeople who made the most money, or teachers who improve their students' grades the most, have similar personality traits. First of all, they have self-control, the ability to avoid distractions and get things done. A person with self-control has the patience to wait for something better to happen in the future. In addition, Duckworth noticed that successful people have determination or grit. People with grit work hard and don't give up. They stay with a task even if it's hard, or if it takes a long time. Making a great, thank you, Emily. So I don't. I hope you could hear it. It was a little hard for me to hear, but they um, basically there were two main research findings. One were people with self-control, and people with grit were the ones who seemed to be more successful in her research. Now, uh, I don't know. So I just want to show you these two activities here. I don't think you can do them because we didn't listen to the entire reading. But the, the first one is the first activity, understanding purpose, match each of the paragraphs from the, pas from the passage to its purpose. So for example, if you look at the right side, to summarize what Duckworth discovered, and you have to match it to the paragraph. That kind of activity basically is a, you know, it's, it's a uh, literal comprehension. Did you understand what you read? Did you understand what the words and the reason behind uh, the paragraph? And the second activity, complete the summary of Duck War study in your own words, again, is asking the students, did you understand it? And it's a, it's a little bit harder than just, you know, a yes, no question or, uh, you know, what's the main idea, choose A, B, C, because they actually have to use their own words to summarize. But both of these activities are asking about the main ideas and basic understanding. It's harder to summarize, I agree, yes. You can see that these, the, even though these are basic understanding questions, they're not, so, they're not as easy as a lot of them. And one of the things you'll find in this series is we feel really strongly that we want to kind of challenge students and push them because our, our research and our experience shows that students want to be challenged. They want to learn and they want to rise to the occasion. The next activities here, and this is one I want you to do, so we're going to do this together. Read the quotes below. Which of them are examples of someone with grit and which are of someone with self-control? Write G for grit and S for self-control. So number one, just to say G or S. One, is it G? My friends asked me to go to a concert, but I said no because I need to study G or S. 
Okay, self-control, good. Number two, number two, I failed my driving test several times, but I managed to pass on the fifth time. Self-control or grit? Grit. Okay, good. You guys are too good. <laughs> what kind of skill is that? Is, what kind of skill is, are we practicing here? When they have to read a statement and, based on what they read, decide if it's it is critical thinking, yes. It's a deeper understanding. It's deduction, ability to summarize. Basically, we're asking them to apply what these concepts are, grit and self-control, to different situations. And application is one of the most important parts of critical thinking when you can apply learning to a new situation. And that's what we're asking them to do. Look at the next question, next activity. Which adv advice below would Duckworth probably give? Go ahead and answer this one. Only do the things you like most, challenge yourself, and don't give up halfway, or start with an easy skill first. OK, you guys are good. You guys are good. You guys are good. I would Lovely. OK, the answer is B, challenge yourself and don't give up halfway. And what kind of skill are we practicing here? What kind of critical thinking? This is critical thinking because it's going beyond the literal meaning and asking them students to do something. Inference, very, oh, Andrew O'Shea. Inferencing, OK. It is a kind of critical thinking. They have to infer what Duckworth would say. Would, would say. They don't actually read this, but based on what they've read, they can conclude or infer that she would say, challenge herself. Very good. So look, uh, and, and here is what the page actually looks like. You can see we have categorizing was what you did earlier. They had to categorize grit and self-control. And categorizing here is a kind of application. And here, as you all correctly said, critical thinking inferring. One of the nice features about the new edition of Pathways is that the skills are clearly signposted, so you know and students know what is, expect, what is expected of them. Okay, vocabulary. We are moving now. So we've talked about the content and how that promotes critical thinking, that authentic content. We've talked about the skill building. Oh, there was one thing I wanted to say really quickly before we move off of this, and that is that um, this is predicting the sequence of activities. So they start with predicting, which is an important reading skill. They go to basic comprehension, an important reading skill, to the deeper level critical thinking or application of ideas to new situations on the reading. So the very nice sequence of critical thinking of reading skills. All right, vocabulary. I think, and I, I think you, I hope most, or hope many of you agree, vocabulary, without vocabulary, students are not going to get very far. And um, we feel that vocabulary should be carefully selected, it should be um, contextually presented, and it should be recycled. And I'm going to start here by showing you a Vocabulary, this is a, a, a traditional, or this is not traditional, this is a vocabulary activity where you're given a word box, words and definitions, and then you have an activity, complete the sentences with a word from the box. So they read the sentences and choose a word from the box. How many of you have either seen or done an activity like this with your students? Me, me, done, yes, yes, me, 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 me. I love this webinar thing. Um, OK, we've all done it. All of us have, in our careers, done um, activities like this. Nothing wrong with it, OK? But I want you to rate it. Now, you guys are experienced teachers, most of you. I want you to rate that vocabulary. Is it effective? Is it excellent, very good, satisfactory, or not satisfactory? OK, 
Okay, so this is interesting. I think um, it looks like a lot of you think it's very good. Um, next is satisfactory, and then some of you think it's excellent. And these these are fine results. Um, and I want to I'm going to contend that let's see if I can close this. I don't know how to close this box. Okay, um, that this activity. The words avoid, compare, consist of, crash, cure, extreme, those are fine words. The sentences below, are they connected? That when there are weather conditions such as a big snowstorm, airports sometimes close before you book a flight, those seem to be connected. There was a five car on the highway, I tried to driving. So there is some connection, a little bit of connection, yeah. So it's, it's not bad. But I want to show you the way we've done it in Pathways and all others of our materials. In Pathways, the vocabulary is introduced and practiced. Oh, there's a spelling mistake. Practiced in real world context. And I don't know if you can see this. I hope you can. This is the way the vocabulary is presented in Pathways Listening and Speaking. You, uh, it's a quiz. How much do you know about water? So the first question is the Amazon River supplies about 20% or I think that's 20 or 27% of the fresh water that enters the world's oceans. So they have to put true or false. Now they may or may not know it but they're being the target word is supplies and they're being asked to consider that word in a, in a real context it, with real meaning. Farmers require 511 gallons of water to produce 222 pounds of rice, true or false. So we don't expect students to know if these are right or wrong, but the situation is it's a real world context. These are it's real information. And then the next activity, the first activity under that is they match the word with its definition. Based on these sentences in the quiz, they should be able to match supplies to to bring to whatever it is. I don't actually I think I cut this off so it's not the full exercise but to match the word with a definition and then the next one is to work in a group and say whether you agree or disagree with each of the st statements below. I need to reduce the amount of water I use. The key word is reduce. Asking them to say yeah I need to reduce the amount of water I use because and to personalize that gets them to use the vocabulary. So what this sequence of activities shows is vocabulary presented in context here, checking the meaning, and then using it. Now I want to ask you in the next slide here that we also feel that words should be very carefully selected and that means that we're choosing words that are high frequency, high use, that are appropriate for the level using the Cepher tools of you know what Cepher level that words are, and the academic word list. Okay, so here's a task for you. Which of the words, there are four academic words on this list. Can you guess what they are? How many, and this is hard. This is a really putting you on the spot. Which words are academic word? If you can get adequate is correct. Anybody else? Manage. I would think manage too, but it's not. Significant is correct. Resource is correct. Okay, very good. <laughs> very, very good. Now, I didn't know this. I had to cheat. So don't feel bad if you didn't know that. Require is one. Significant, adequate, and resource. But the other words, supply, manage, collect, flow, and amount, you can see those are important words. They are not, you know, sometimes in books, and I, it really bothers me, I see books where you've got these words that are just not important for students to know when they have so much vocabulary that they do need. And so really when you choose your materials, look carefully at the vocabulary. It's so important. Please rate now that you've seen those vocabulary activities, please rate them. Emily? Oh, Emily, are you putting in the, uh, there you go, thank you. 
kind of. Uh, And you be honest, you can hate them too, you know, you can say that's too much. <laughs> okay, but it looks like most of you think they are excellent or very good. And I, I, you know, having worked on, you know, Emily told you how long I've been working in this field, having worked in this business a long time and, and teaching a long time, I think that the vocabulary exercises and pathways are really, really very well done. And the reason I think that is because, um, as Nation says, Paul Nation, who most of you know is a vocabulary expert in the field of English language teaching, new vocabulary is recognized after seven plus occurrences passively and used only after 20 plus occurrences for active. Students need that constant recycling. If you just do one activity, where they fill in the blank, that's not going to do it. Those words have got to keep coming back at them in different instances, different occurrences, and it has to be recycled throughout their learning. So carefully selected, introduced and practiced in real world context, and recycled. That's how vocabulary needs to be, well, in my opinion anyway, needs to be presented and for students to really have a good chance of acquiring the new words. So that kind of brings me to the conclusion here, and I don't know, yeah, I think actually we will have some time for questions, that's good. We started off, this is talking about keys to academic success using Pathways Second Edition, and all the samples I showed you were from Pathways. And the first Key is really content that engages, is relevant, and promotes critical thinking. We believe that using real-world content as springboard for questions, a springboard for any work you do, gets students to think. And that means that students will process language more deeply, and it will become more memorable. memorable. I mean, think about your own learning. If you are thinking deeply about something, then those connections will be made in your brain and there's a better chance that that expression you use to describe something will stick. And also important because we know that critical thinking is important in academics, in the everyday life and in work, it starts develop, developing students' critical thinking muscles. Always ask questions that encourage students to personalize because when students internalize, language becomes more memorable, then they helps students see their place in the world and using English to do that will facilitate uh, language learning. Second, we looked at skill development, presenting skills explicitly, making sure that the practice is communicative and purposeful. By explicit, we mean tell students what the skill is and why it's important. Tell students how to do the skill. It's not enough to say summarize, you have to tell them how to do it. And, you know, the example I showed you in there for summarize the reading, presumably beforehand they had been taught how to summarize. Use meaningful context and give students a chance to apply skills in a purposeful way. You all know that. And finally, the third key is vocabulary that is carefully chosen, contextualized, and recycled. Choose high frequency, high use in academic words, if that's the goal of your students. Present in an informative and real context, not the made up world, and provide multiple encounters with each word. Back to the visual, content skills and vocabulary, and all of the, again, all of the activities and content I showed you come from Pathways. Pathways is a 10 book series. It has listening speaking. There are the 10 books at the top here. The five books at the top are listening speaking, starting foundations level, which is A1, A2, up to four, which is C1, C2. I'm sorry, C1, not C2. So A1 to A2 to C1. There's listening speaking. And down here, you have your reading writing titles. And um, I thank you for your attention. I, I would like to ask if you have any questions before Emily is going to 
kind of do the closing uh, honors here. But does anybody have any questions? How much do the books cost? <laughs> Are the books available in American English and British English? That's a good question. Actually, this Pathways was really developed with a global English in mind. You may have noticed that the uh, person who read the reading, because all of the readings are on audio, he was a British speaker or a British English speaker. Many of our, um, much of the audio in listening speaking is done by either non-native speakers or uh, other varieties of English, Australian, Indian, British. So um, it is not just American. We really consider it a global English. Oh, there's so many questions here. I don't know how to respond so fast. <laughs> um, who is, which one is the A1, A2? A1, A2 is the foundations level. Um, and so, Emily, do you want to close it? Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. I, I'm thrilled to be communicating with people all over the world. I love it. It's, it's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily, Laura. To you. Oh, thank you. It was such an informative and interesting webinar. I know I learned a lot. I hope you all did, too. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Um, and if you did enjoy this webinar, as Laura mentioned in the beginning, this is the first of four webinars in the Pathways Second Edition series. And you will get a special certificate for attending all four. So we'd love to see you at the next one, which is on March 16th, presented by Christian Lee. Um, and a few just final things to mention. As Laura pointed out, many of the examples were from National Geographic Learning's Pathways Second Edition. If you do have any questions about you know, obtaining samples of this or you know, finding out more information about getting it, please, um, I'll put the link in the, little, the chat box here, but um, contact your local rep in your region um, from National Geographic Learning. And secondly, we will be sending a certificate of attendance following the webinar along with the slides, a handout, and a recording of the session. You can expect to receive this within five days. So just um, you know, stay tuned for that. And if you enjoyed this webinar, we'd love to you know, see you join us again. Um, you can view the upcoming schedules of uh, upcoming webinars on ngl.cengage.com backslash webinars. Uh, and we do have these for adult learners, teen learners, and young learners, so we'd love to see you again. And then we also have a blog that we'd love you know, for you to subscribe to. It's full of teaching tips from the ELT classroom. Laura will have a blog post related to this webinar coming out next week 